Am I audible? Am I audible? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to GoSco Learning, the fastest growing edtech company in Middle East. And our main aim is to provide quality education for all. I'm your Dhanya ma'am with the quick revision of your solution and chemical kinetics chapter. Hope you all are preparing well for your coming board exam on Tuesday. So let's have a quick revision on our solution and chemical kinetics chapter. So first we can discuss about the solution chapter, right? And there are a few important terms in that chapter, the Henry's law, Rolls law, that uh, colligative properties, we can just have a quick revision of all those things, the theoretical aspects in the solution chapter, okay? So first thing as the solutions that you know, it's a homogeneous mixture of two or more components and in this particular chapter, we are discussing only on the binary solutions. That means the solution which contain two components, right? Okay. So, first we can discuss there are different solutions that is gaseous solutions in which the solvent will be a gas and the liquid solutions in which the solvent will be liquid state and the solid solutions in which the solvent is in the solid state, right? And based on that for gaseous solutions, there are, of course, the solvent will be gases and three possibilities are whether the solute is gas and we have the example of mixture of oxygen and nitrogen and if the solvent is gas and the solute is liquid, we have the example of chloroform mixed in nitrogen gas and the third category is the solvent is gas and the solute is solid. We have the example of camphor in nitrogen gas. Okay, that's about the gaseous solutions and liquid solutions is, we know if it is a liquid solution, definitely the solvent will be in the liquid phase, right? So, see here, the solvent is in the liquid phase and we have three categories in that. That is the, if the solvent is liquid, the solute will be, solute can be gas and we have the example of oxygen, dissolved oxygen in water. It's an example for a liquid solution in which the solute is oxygen gas, right? The second one is the solvent is liquid and the solute is also liquid. And for that, we have the example of alcohol, ethanol dissolved in water. And the third category is the solvent is liquid, but the solute is solid. For that, we have the example of glucose dissolved in water, salt dissolved in water. They all are examples of solids in liquid solutions okay the third one is the solid solutions so for a solid solutions is the solvent will be in the face of solid right the solvent will be solid state and for that we have the example for first one is the gas in solid we have the example of hydrogen in palladium Liquid in solid, we have the example of amalgam of mercury with the sodium. Solid in solids is we know the gold. Okay. So that is about the different types of solutions and you should know the common examples is for different types of solutions. Now let's see what are the different methods of expressing the concentration of solutions. As we know there are different ways we can express the concentrations of solutions that is the percentage weight by volume percentage weight by weight or percentage volume by volume that is the mass percentage volume percentage mass by volume percentage mass percentage is nothing but the percentage weight by weight that means how much mass of solute is present in 100 gram of the solvent solution sorry volume percentage is percentage volume by volume Mass by volume percentage is percentage weight by volume. That means how much gram of solute is present in 100 ml of solution. Okay, that is the different basis of expressing the percentage. Mass percentage, volume percentage and mass by volume percentage. So, if it is given a 95 percentage volume by volume solution, that means it contains 95 ml of solute dissolved in 100 ml of solution. Okay. 
then comes the parts per million ppm this is usually we are expressing you are using this parts per million to express the amount of impurities present in air or in water okay that much very uh, less amount of substances for expressing that concentration we will be using the parts per million and the mass by volume percentage is mainly we are using in medicinal preparations okay so the next comes the three important things the molarity molality and mole fraction the molarity we are expressing by the letter capital m that means molar okay the molarity is nothing but the number of moles of number of moles of solute divided by total volume of solution in liter right the molarity is the number of moles of solute divided by the total volume of solution in liter whereas molality which we are representing with small letter m is the number of moles of solute number of moles of solute upon the mass of solvent in kilogram Okay, see the difference. Mass of solvent in kilogram. So when you get a question on based on what is the difference between molarity and molality, molarity is nothing but the number of moles of solute per total volume of solution that is expressed in liter. Volume of solution expressed in liter. And molality is the number of moles of solute upon the mass of solvent in kilogram. Okay, see here the volume of solution in liter for molality it is the mass of solvent in kilogram okay and you know that the volume of solution will vary with the temperature but the mass of solvent is not varying with the temperature right and we are expressing the molarity by using the letter m and the unit will be mole per liter whereas the molality is mole per kilogram right and the last one is the mole fraction the mole fraction is the mole fraction is expressed by pi right is expressed sorry is denoted by the symbol chi and if you have two component okay so i will write the unit here we are expressing it in mole per liter right okay then about the mole fraction if we have two component a and b if you want to find the mole fraction of the component a that is mole fraction of a chi a is equal to number of moles of a divided by total number of moles that is number of moles of a plus number of moles of b okay then how will you find out the number of moles of a it is nothing but the given mass of a divided by the molar mass of a same like you can find the number of moles of b also so if you want to find the mole fraction of the component b what it is either you can do it by number of moles of b divided by number of moles of a plus number of moles of b or if it is a binary solution keep in mind that the mole fraction of a plus mole fraction of b is equal to 1 so once you get the mole fraction of a if you want to find the mole fraction of b you can simply subtract the value of mole fraction of a from 1. Okay, that is chi. Once you get the chi a value, if you want to find the chi b value, substitute the chi a value. Chi b is equal to 1 minus chi a. Okay, this is for the binary solutions. I hope the different ways of expressing the concentration is okay. Now we can move on to the that is mass percentage that already we discussed the volume percentage mass by volume percentage parts per million molarity and molality that all things we have discussed the mole fraction also now let's move on to the solubility okay what is solubility solubility is the maximum amount of solute okay the maximum amount of solute that can be dissolved in 100 gram of a solvent a particular temperature is called the solubility 
okay in 100 gram of the solvent at the given temperature what is maximum amount of solute that we can dissolve in that particular solvent is what the solubility of that solute okay now let's see the solubility of gas in liquid okay the solubility of gas in a particular liquid is always dependent on the pressure and on the temperature and the effect of or the so effect of pressure on the solubility of gas in liquid is expressed by the henry's law okay so if you want to dissolve a particular gas in a given solvent how to apply pressure right so according to henry's law how much pressure you are applying on the top of the gas for dissolving it in that liquid the solubility of gas will be directly proportional to pressure if you are applying more pressure more gas will be dissolved in the solvent if you are applying less pressure the solubility of gas in the liquid will be very less okay that is the effect of pressure so we can say the solubility of gas is directly proportional to pressure more pressure applying more the solubility less pressure less will be the solubility okay the second fraction is the second factor is the temperature okay we all know that we used to store the carbonated soft drinks in the refrigerator right why because when the temperature is low the solubility of gas will be more that means the solubility of gas in a liquid is inversely proportional to temperature when you increase the temperature the solubility of gas decreases when you decrease the temperature the solubility of gas increases right so now let's see the effect of pressure in detail i have told you the effect of pressure that is the solubility of gas in liquid what is the effect of pressure it is expressed by henry's law so henry's law the solubility of gas in a liquid is directly proportional to the pressure of the gas if you are applying more pressure the more will be the solubility of gas okay so the henry's law describes the quantitative relationship between the pressure and the solubility of gas in a container in the solvent so henry's law states that the partial pressure of the gas in the vapor phase p the pressure of the gas in the vapor phase that is the pressure in the gas that the pressure exerted by the gas in the vapor phase is proportional to the mole fraction of gas in the solution if you are applying more pressure there will be more gas in the solution that means the concentration of gas in the solution will be more so as we discussed earlier the mole fraction is a way of expressing the concentration of a solution so we can say the vapor pressure of the gas on the solution is directly proportional the vapor pressure of the gas in the vapor phase is directly proportional to the mole fraction of the gas in solution so when you express this in the mathematic in the terms we can say the pressure p is in that the pressure p is directly proportional to the mole fraction of gas that is chi p is proportional to chi mole fraction of the gas in the solution when i change this proportionality i can write the pressure p is equal to kh into pi right where kh is called the henry's law constant okay so see p is equal to kh into pi so i can write it as kh is equal to pressure p by chi right see here the kh value is inversely proportional to chi the mole fraction of gas mole fraction means the solubility of gas right or the concentration of gas so what we can say if the kh value henry's law constant value for a particular solution is higher that means its solubility or the concentration of that gas in the solution is very less see it is inversely proportional higher kh value indicate 
the lesser is the mole fraction or lesser is the solubility. Okay. okay now let's see the applications of Henry's law. So, we know the first application is the production of carbonated drinks. We know that for the carbonated drinks, the carbon dioxide gas at a high pressure is dissolved in the water. That is what the carbonated soft drinks, right? That's why when you are opening the lid, we can see the sound. That is the pressure is releasing. So, when the pressure is releasing, the dissolved ox uh, gases will be liberating out, right? So, the first application is the production of carbonated drinks. When you are applying more pressure, more carbon dioxide will be dissolved, right? And in the deep sea diving, the bent or compressed thickness. To avoid bends, okay, that is the toxic effect of high concentration of nitrogen in blood. That is in the scuba diving, at the bottom of the seawater, there the pressure will be more, right? So, more gases will be dissolved in the blood. So, when in that uh, gases, there will be high concentration of nitrogen. So, when they reach the top of the water, the pressure is less, right? So, at that time, this dissolved gases will be coming out and this nitrogen will cause the, there will be a high concentration of nitrogen in the blood. So, the tank, that condition is what we called bent, right? That condition is called bends or compressed sickness. So, so, in order to avoid that bends, the tanks used in scuba divers are filled with air diluted with helium. That means it will contain 11.7% helium, 56.2% nitrogen and 32.1% oxygen. Okay. That is the application of Henry's law in scuba diving. And the last application is the mountain climbing. Okay. So, to in the for the climbers or people living in the high altitude, due to the less pressure, there will be amount of oxygen, the amount of dissolved oxygen in their blood will be very less. That condition is called anoxia, that is the absence of oxygen. Okay. So, there also we can apply the Henry's law. Okay. And one more thing is that as we discussed, when the temperature is more, the solubility of gas in liquid is less. When the temperature is less, the solubility of gas is more, right? So, now you can say what is the reason why the aquatic animals are feeling more comfortable in the cold water than in the warm water. What may be the reason? In cold water, there will be more dissolved oxygen so that they can live comfortably. But in hot water, as the temperature increases, the solubility of gas in water decreases. That means there will be very less amount of oxygen that makes the aquatic animals uncomfortable in hot water. Okay. So, that is about the solubility of gas in liquid, the Henry's law, the effect of temperature on solubility of gas in liquid liquids. Now we can see the next category that is the solubility of liquids in liquids. Okay. For that first you should know what is mean by the vapor pressure of a solution. So whenever a liquid is making the vapors, the pressure exerted by the vapors is what we call the vapor pressure, right? The vapor pressure is the maximum pressure exerted by a vapor in equilibrium with the liquid. Okay, so the vapor pressure always depends only on the temperature and the nature of the liquid and it does not depend on the volume of the container or the amount of the solvent. When you are producing more temperature, that means there will be more vapors producing. So, of course, as the temperature increases, it will affect the vapor pressure. So, vapor pressure depends only on the temperature and nature of the solvent, whether the sol liquid is volatile or non-volatile. Okay. Now, let's see the vapor pressure of liquid, liquid solution. We have taken a liquid which is volatile and to that volatile liquid, we are adding a solute that is also volatile in nature. So, the vapor pressure produced by the solution will be the sum of the vapors of the solvent and the solute, right? So, there the total vapor pressure, the vapor pressure here just imagine. Just imagine you have a closed container. In that, you have taken the solvent, volatile solvent A. Of course, this volatile solvent will produce the vapors, right? And to that volatile solvent, you are adding 
you are adding a volatile volatile liquid solute okay volatile liquid solute of course this volatile liquid solute will also produce vapors right so what we can write the vapor pressure the vapor pressure of the component due to solute i am taking solute as the b pb is equal to or pb will be directly proportional to the vapor pressure exerted by the component pb will be directly proportional to how much amount of b in the solution right that is the mole fraction of b how much amount of b is there based on that the vapors are producing so the pressure exerted by the component b will be directly proportional to mole fraction of b in the solution right same like that the vapor pressure of component a pa will be directly proportional to mole fraction of component a right so i can rewrite the i can change the proportionality i can write it as pb is equal to p not b into chi b same way pa is equal to pa is equal to p not a into chi a where this p not b and p not a are the vapor pressure of the pure component of b and pure component of a right so if you are taking the component a alone that is if you are taking the solvent alone what is the vapor pressure produced by that a is the p not a the vapor pressure produced by the pure component a when you are mixing the b component in the a the vapor pressure exerted by a will be depending on how much concentration of a in the solution the vapor pressure produced by the b component will be equal to concentration of b in the solution right so what we can say the total pressure p total the total pressure inside this the total pressure will be equal to pressure due to a plus vapor pressure exerted by component b that i can rewrite as pa is equal to what p not a into chi a plus pb is what p not b into chi b right that is what the rolls law and dalton law states for a solution of volatile liquid the partial vapor pressure of each component of the solution is directly proportional to its mole fraction right the for the solution volatile liquids for a solution are containing volatile solvent and volatile solute the partial pressure of each component the partial pressure of b or partial pressure of a in the com of the component in the solution is directly proportional to what the mole fraction of that component in the solution okay so this is what the dalton law that is the total pressure will be equal to sum of the individual component that is pa plus pb that we can rewrite as p not a p a is nothing but p not a into chi a so p not a chi a plus p not b chi b right that is about the vapor pressure of the liquid in liquid there you should know the rolls law okay now see the vapor pressure of solutions of solids in liquids okay vapor pressure of solutions of solids in liquids so for that here we have taken the beaker okay in that as we did in the first experiment we are taking a solvent this solvent is okay we are taking the solvent okay the solvent is volatile so it will produce the vapors right it will produce the vapors but here the solute the solute that is solid state the solid solute that we are adding is non volatile okay so whatever the solutes you are adding it is non volatile so i am adding the solid solute in it okay it is non volatile so 
the vapors here the vapors produced by only due to what only due to the solvent but the vapors produced here will be very less compared to that of the pure solvent what may be the reason this solute particle will take place the positions on the top of the layer of the solvent right so that will hinder the formation of or that will reduce the formation of vapors so always keep in mind that the vapor pressure of the pure component okay the vapor pressure of the pure component is or pure solvent is always greater than that of the solution if you are adding a non volatile solute into the solvent okay so now let's see the difference between the ideal and non ideal solutions what do you mean by an ideal solution we have discussed in detail about the rolls law right so ideal solutions are those solutions which obey the rolls law in the entire range of concentration the solution which obey rolls law over the entire range of concentration are known as ideal solutions now let's see a graph for the ideal solution that is the solutions which obey the rolls law okay here i have taken the mole fraction here this is the graphical representation for rolls law okay here i am taking the vapor pressure okay so for the first component i am taking here the mole fraction is 1 here it is 0 for the second component chi 2 the mole fraction 0 and chi 2 the mole fraction is equal to 1 okay so for the first solution 0 to this is straight line right okay and the second component it will be like this okay so here chi 1 is 0 so i am here getting the p not 1 chi 2 is 1 so it is p not 2 so when you join this two lines you will be getting the sorry you should be a straight line okay you will be getting the p total okay so those solutions which obey this rolls law we are calling it as the ideal solution and here we have few examples is for ideal solution that is normal hexene and normal heptane mixture is an example for ideal solution which will obey the rolls law and bromoethane and chloroethane is another example and benzene and toluene is another examples for solution which show or which obey rolls law or solution which are ideal solutions okay the second next one is the thermodynamic conditions for an ideal solution so here whatever the interaction interaction between the solute solute and interaction between the solute solvent interaction and solute solute interaction and solvent solvent interaction will be similar okay so if the molecular interaction before and after mixing remains the same the solution would be an ideal that means solute solute interaction solvent solvent interaction and solute solvent interactions are same okay and the enthalpy of mixing the energy absorbed when solvent solvent bond and solute solute bond are broken is exactly equal to the energy released when solute solvent bond is formed that means the delta h of mixing will be zero for an ideal solution and also the delta v the change in volume volume of mixing will be zero since intermolecular interaction does not change after mixing the volume remains the same and also the delta s that is the entropy entropy is the you know that entropy is measure of randomness and in solution two different types of particles are present so entropy of the solution is always higher than the pure solvent and the pure solute so delta s value will always be positive for an ideal solution so that's about the ideal solution which obey the rolls law and there are non ideal solution that means which do not obey the rolls law for that there is positive solution which show 
positive deviation from Rolle's law and the solution which show negative deviation from Rolle's law. Positive deviation means there the total pressure, P total will be greater than what we calculated from the Rolle's law. Why it is like that? Because the solute solvent interaction is very weak. Okay. The solute solvent interaction is very weak that is the total pressure exerted will be greater than that of the P total. Okay. So, when a solution that do not obey the Rolle's law over the entire range of solution, then it is called a non-ideal solution and the vapor pressure of such solution will either be higher or lower than that of the predicted by the Rolle's law. If the value is higher than that predicted by the Rolle's law, it is called positive deviation and it is mainly due to the weaker solute solvent interaction and those values which are lower than that of the Rolle's law value, it is called negative deviation. And if it exhibit higher, the solution exhibit positive deviation. And if it is lower, it is exhibit negative deviation from Rolle's law. And for the positive and negative deviation, if it is a positive deviation, your graph will be just above whatever we got for the Rolle's law. Right? If it is a negative deviation, you will be getting a graph just below the value same for every component that is what the negative deviation okay now let's see some examples is for positive and negative deviation okay so for the positive deviation as i told you the solute solvent interaction is very less the solute solvent interaction after mixing decreases. So, more molecules move into the vapor phase contributing more pressure. That is why the total pressure will be more than that predicted from the Rolle's law. So, here the delta H value will be positive and delta V of mixing will be positive. And here we have few examples is that is acetone plus hexane and alcohol. Any alcohol are OH plus cyclohexane and water alcohol mixture. These are the examples is for the positive deviation from Rolle's law. Okay. And for the negative deviation, as I told you, there the solute solvent interaction increases. Okay. Solute solvent interaction after mixing is stronger. Okay. That's why the total pressure will be lesser than that predicted from the Rolle's law. Okay. So, there the delta H of mixing will be negative and delta V of mixing will be negative. And here we have few examples is phenol and aniline, acetone and chloroform, water nitric acid and water HCl. Okay, that is about the positive deviation and the negative deviation from Rolle's law, ideal solution and the non-ideal solutions. Okay. Now, let us see the next term that is the azeotropes. Azeotropes are the nothing but the binary mixtures having same composition in liquid and in vapor phases. They have at, uh, at almost near boiling point. So, we cannot separate these mixtures by fractional distillation method. Okay. So, if two solutions, two liquids is having nearly same boiling point are mixed together that type of mixtures is are what we call azeotropes. Azeotropes are the binary mixtures having same composition in liquid and in the vapor phase. That means they boil at a constant temperature. Okay. This azeotropes can be of two types. The minimum boiling azeotropes and the maximum boiling azeotropes. Okay. The azeotropes are of two type. The minimum boiling azeotrope and the maximum boiling azeotropes. The minimum boiling azeotropes are those solutions which show large positive deviation from Rolle's law are called minimum boiling azeotropes. That means there already the vapors produced is more. That means their boiling will be occurring at a lesser temperature, right? They are what we call the minimum boiling azeotropes. There more vapors are there. That means they show large positive deviation from Rolle's law. 
and for the example for the minimum boiling azeotrope is alcohol and water mixture that is an example for minimum boiling azeotropes and maximum boiling azeotropes are those solutions which show large negative deviation from the rolls law okay those solutions which show large negative deviation from rolls law like the mixture of nitric acid and water is an example for maximum boiling azeotropes that's about the azeotropes okay so we have discussed the solubility of gas in the liquid solubility of liquids in liquids and solubility of solids in liquids now let's move on to the colligative properties colligative properties are those properties which depends on the amount of substances okay the properties which depends on the amount or number of particles of the solute and not depends on the nature of the solute okay whatever the solute you are adding the property is not depending on the nature of the solute but depending on how much concentration how how much number of the solute that you have added that kind of properties is are what we called colligative properties and we have four colligative property that is the relative lowering of vapor pressure elevation of boiling point depression and freezing point and osmotic pressure osmosis and osmotic pressure okay so for that the first one is the relative lowering of vapor pressure okay so in this here we have already mentioned that the vapor pressure of the pure liquid solvent is always greater than the solution right so whenever you are adding the solute there is a decrease in the vapor pressure of the solution right or decrease in the vapor pressure of the solvent so here we can say there is a change in the pressure and that change in pressure change in the vapor pressure is equal to what p not the vapor pressure is greater pure solvent is greater right p not minus the vapor pressure of the solution right okay so here p not minus okay so what it is it will be depending on delta p s delta p is equal to p not if you are adding the component a that we can say p not minus p a the component a will be there in the solution right p a minus the vapor pressure of the solution okay p a. p not minus p a is nothing but p not a into chi a okay so what we can write delta p is equal to p not minus p not sorry p not a minus p not a into chi a that is equal to p not a into 1 minus chi a okay there a is the solvent so what we can write delta p by p not a is equal to 1 minus chi a is nothing but chi b so the relative lowering of vapor pressure is here b is the solute it is proportional to it is equal to what the mole fraction of solute okay so what we can say here the relative lowering of vapor pressure the relative lowering of vapor pressure we can express it delta p delta p by p not is equal to p not a here a is the solvent is equal to mole fraction of component b that is the solute the relative lowering of vapor pressure is proportional to the amount of solute and not on the nature of solute whatever the solute you are adding how much concentration or how much amount you are adding based on that there will be lowering of the vapor pressure right so delta p is what p not a minus p s divided by p not a is equal to chi b that is the equation for relative lowering of vapor pressure and you know chi b is nothing but chi b is equal to number of moles of b divided by number of moles of a plus number of moles of b right and now see elevation of 
boiling point. Whenever you are taking the pure solvent, it's boiling point. Okay. You are taking the pure solvent, it should have a boiling point. When you are adding a volatile solute into it, it will reduce the formation of the vapors, right? Or it will hinder the formation of vapors. So, in order to attain the level of the atmospheric pressure, we have to give more heat, right? So, always the boiling point of solution is greater than that of the pure solvent, right? So, here delta Tb, change in pressure will be equal to boiling point of the solution minus the boiling point of the pure solvent, right? And the equation for the elevation in boiling point delta Tb is equal to Kb into M, where M is nothing but the molality. Molality is more number of moles of solute per mass of solvent in kilogram. And Kb is the Ebullioscopic constant or molar elevation constant. Same like for depression in freezing point, delta Tf. Delta Tf is equal to, there is depression in the freezing point. So, it will be T naught F minus Tf and is equal to Kf into molality. Where Kf is the cryoscopic constant or molar depression constant and M is nothing but the molality. And uh, the last one is the osmosis and osmotic pressure that we can discuss detail and the equation for osmotic pressure. Osmotic pressure is pi is equal to C into R into T where pi is the osmotic pressure, C is the molarity, capital letter M, molarity and R is the gas constant and T is temperature in Kelvin. These are all the Colligative property. Now we can see osmosis and osmotic pressure in detail. Osmosis is nothing but the movement of the solvent molecule. Okay. The solvent molecule movement through a semi-permeable membrane from a pure solvent side. That is from the side where the solvent amount is more, solvent concentration is more to the solution side from less concentration solution to more concentration solution. Here if you have a two solution, this is the pure water and this is the semi-permeable membrane and this is the solution. So, the solvent, the water will be moving from the pure solvent to the solution side. That means from a low concentrated solution to higher concentrated solution through a semi-permeable membrane that is called the osmosis and the pressure that just required to stop the process of osmosis is called the osmotic pressure. Okay. The pressure required to solve the uh, stop the osmosis is called the osmotic pressure and when you are applying a pressure greater than osmotic pressure what will happen? The solvent will move from the solution side to the pure solvent side, right? If you are applying a pressure greater than the osmotic pressure, the solvent will move from the solution to the pure solvent side and that is called a reverse osmosis and that process is used for the purification of water. Now, let's see if two solutions is have having same osmotic pressure, that type of solutions are what we call the isotonic solutions, okay? And we know that for our body fluids is the blood, the osmotic pressure associated with the fluid inside of the blood is 0.9 percentage weight by volume of sodium chloride solution. So, if you are taking a solution that contain 0.9 percentage weight by volume, we can say it is isotonic to body fluid. And if your concentration is greater than 0.9 percentage, that type of solutions are called hypertonic solutions. So, if you are dipping the human cell in a hypertonic solution, what will happen? The water will move from the cell to the solution, right? So, the cell will loses the water and it starts to drink, okay? If you are keeping a solution which have a concentration less than 0.9 percentage weight by volume, that type of solutions are what we call hypotonic to body fluid, right? So, if you are keeping a cell in the hypotonic solution, what will happen? The hypotonic solutions are having more water content, more solvent, right? So, the solvent will move from the hypotonic solution into the cell. That causes the cell to swell, right? That is the effect of hypotonic, isotonic and hypotonic cells is on the 
blood cells is right now the last term is the abnormal molar mass okay the abnormal molar mass when the molar mass calculated with the help of the colligative property we can find that it will be different from the theoretical molecular mass what may be the reason it is because of the association and dissociation of the molecules either it will be having association or will be due to the dissociation of molecule and for that we have to find out the van hoff factor and there are three equations is for finding out the van hoff factor van hoff factor is represented with the letter i and i is equal to normal molar mass by abnormal molar mass or i is equal to observed value of the colligative property divided by calculated value of the colligative property or i is equal to total number of moles of the particles is after association or dissociation or num per number of molecules of particle before association or dissociation that is after association and before association these are the main things is in the solution chapter okay so now we can move on to the kinetics chapter okay so i hope solution is entirely clear you have to know all the equations so based on the van hoff factor we can say that the elevation in boiling point the, the elevation in boiling point delta tf is equal to sorry this elevation in boiling point delta tb this is for freezing point right delta tb is equal to kb into m right so when you find the van hoff factor we can say based on association or dissociation it will be tb into van hoff factor into kb into m same like for freezing point depression delta tf is equal to i into kf into m and same like for relative lowering of vapor pressure delta p by p is equal to i into pi of solute and for a uh, osmotic pressure also we can find how to give the van hoff factor okay that is based on the abnormal molar mass okay that's all about the solution chapter now can we move on to chemical kinetics just revise the solution so we can start with the chemical kinetics okay so chemical kinetics we know it is the branch of chemistry which is dealing with the speed or rate of the reactions is and uh, we can express the rate of reaction either in the terms of decrease in the concentration of reactant or increase in the concentration of product right if you have a reaction r is changing into p we can express the rate either in the change in the concentration of either reactant that means the reactant concentration is decreasing and the product concentration is increasing with the time taken right or that is what the rate of reaction in terms of decrease in the concentration of reactant by time or increase in the concentration of product with the time okay now let's see the rate of a reaction we can express the speed of reactions as either in two ways that is the average reaction that is for a particular period of time or instantaneous rate the rate of reaction at that particular instant so for average rate we will be representing it with the change in concentration with the delta symbol that is we are making for a change for a particular period of time right so huge difference is there so we will use the term delta there for the instantaneous rate the rate at a particular instant so there the we will be using the changes in terms of e because the fraction very small differences will be there right that is different basis the average rate and instantaneous rate now let's see what are the factors that affect the speed of a chemical reaction okay that as we know when you increase the concentration of reactant there will be of course the rate of reaction will be more right also we will discuss in detail what is the effect of temperature we all know that when you increase the temperature the rate of reaction will be increased and when the pressure or presence of catalyst catalyst is will always increases the rate of reaction and we will see in detail how the catalyst affect the rate of reaction and rust factors the nature of reactant the surface area and uh, the effect of radiations these are the factors which affect the rate of a chemical reaction now let's see the very important the rate law rate law according to rate law we have an equation aa plus bb giving cc plus dd according to rate law the rate of this reaction 
is directly proportional to molar concentration of the reactant with each term, each concentration term raised to some power which may or may not be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient. Sometimes it can be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient. Sometimes it may not be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient. So, we can say the rate is equal to when you change the proportionality, we can write rate constant K into concentration of A raised to X and concentration of B raised to Y. So, now see the rate law is the expression in which the rate is given in terms of the molar concentration of reactant with each term raised to some power which may or may not be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient in the balanced chemical equation. And these values we are finding out by experimental data. It may not be equal to the stoichiometric coefficient of the balanced of the reactant in balanced chemical equation. Okay. Now see we have got here the x and y value which we have find out by the experimental data and the sum of this x and y is what we call the order of the reaction. The sum of the powers of the concentration of the reactant in the rate law expression is called the order of that chemical reaction. Right? Now what you mean by the molecularity? Molecularity is nothing but the how many number of molecules is, how many number of molecules or ions is are actually participated in chemical reaction is what we called the molecularity. The number of reacting species is taking part in an elementary reaction which must collide simultaneously in order to bring about the chemical reaction is called molecularity and based on the number of molecules the reaction can be unimolecular that means only one molecule is there if you change, consider the decomposition of calcium carbonate here only one molecule of calcium carbonate is there so we can say it is a unimolecular reaction if there is two molecules is involved then it is called bimolecular reaction okay hydrogen h2 plus iodine giving 2HI. See, one molecule of hydrogen, one molecule of iodine there, right? So, it is a two together, two molecules are involved. So, it is an example for bimolecular reaction and if there is three molecules, then it is an example for trimolecular reaction. Now, let us see the difference between the order and the molecularity. As we told, the order is the sum of the exponents in the rate law expression and whereas the molecularity is the number of molecules that is actually actively participating in the chemical reaction. The order can have values 0, fractional or integer values but you know that whether the molecularity will anyway any time it will be 0 that means 0 molecule is reacting. Is it possible? No, right? So, the molecularity value will never be 0. It will be having only integer values greater than 0 and we can write order for both elementary and complex reaction. What is an elementary reaction? The reaction which is taking place in a single step is called an elementary reaction and the reaction which is taking place in more than one step is called complex reactions. And we can apply the order for both the elementary and the complex reaction. If a reaction is taking place in more than one or two or three steps, the number of molecules involved in the reaction will be same, right? So, the molecularity we can apply only for the elementary reactions. And we know that the order, the rate law exponents are calculated on the experimental data. So, the order will be a experimental quantity. But the molecularity we are predicting, the, we are telling the molecularity based on the balanced chemical equation, right? So, the odd molecularity is a theoretical quantity. Okay, so that is the difference between the order and the molecularity. Now, see what is a pseudo first order reaction. Pseudo first order reactions are those reactions which is not truly of first order, but under certain condition, it becomes reactions of first order is called a pseudo first order. Pseudo means false. It is not actually a first order reaction, but due to some certain conditions, the reaction is following the first order kinetics. That type of reactions are what we call pseudo first order reaction and here we have two examples is given in the NCRT reader that is the hydrolysis of ester. Okay, in hydrolysis of ester due to the presence of more concentration, large amount of water, even though if it is feel to be fo following higher order, it follows the first order reaction. That is why it is called a pseudo first order reaction and inversion of 
cane sugar is also another example. So, whenever you see these two examples, you should know that it is a pseudo first order reaction. Okay. Now, let us see the integrated rate equation. So, for, as, as we told that in the rate law expression, rate is equal to K into concentration of A raised to X and B raised to Y. Okay, so if both x and y are 0, that means x plus y is equal to 0. That is what a, what will be the order? Order will be 0, right? Then rate is equal to k into concentration of a raised to 0 and b raised to 0. The number with the power 0 means it is 1, right? So here rate is equal to rate constant k. So what we can say, 0 order reactions are those reactions in which in which the rate of reaction is not at all depending on the concentration of the reactant. Okay. So, zero order reactions are those reactions in which the rate of reaction is proportional to the zero power of the concentration of reaction reactant. So, here the rate of reaction is proportional to zero power of the concentration of reactant. That means it is not depending on the concentration of the reactant. That type of reactions are what we call zero order reaction and what is the integrated rate equation for zero order reaction? K is equal to initial concentration of reactant R0 minus final concentration of reactant Rt divided by T. Right? This is what the integrated rate equation for the zero order reactions. And here we have the graphical representation. So, we have the equation K is equal to R0 minus Rt by T. Okay. So, I can rewrite it as Kt is equal to R0 minus Rt. So, I am taking, I can rewrite the same equation as Rt is equal to, I am taking this Rt on this side and Kt on left, right side minus Kt plus R0. This is in the form of y is equal to mx plus c. So, when you are plotting a graph of rt in y axis and x in t in the time in the x axis, you will be getting a straight line with a straight line with a y intercept r0 and a slope minus k. That is what we are getting here. Okay. So, whenever you see a graph of y axis rt versus time with a straight line, slope minus k and y intercept r0 you should identify that it is a zero order reaction okay now let's see the examples of zero order reaction some enzyme catalyzed reactions which occur on the metal surfaces are of zero order and the decomposition of ammonia on the platinum surfaces is a zero order at high pressure so ammonia decomposing okay the decomposition of ammonia is of zero order reaction and the thermal decomposition of hydrogen iodide on gold surface is also a examples for zero order reaction. Now, let us see the integrated rate equation for first order reaction. For first order reaction, we know once we done the integration, we will get the equation as ln Rt minus ln R0 is equal to minus Kt and when you convert it into the log value, what you are getting K is equal to 2.303 by T log R0 by Rt, right? So, here if you are rewriting the equation ln Rt is equal to minus Kt plus ln R0. So, that is in the form of y equal to mx plus C. So, when you plot the graph log, natural log of RT, final concentration of reactant versus time, you will be getting a straight line with y intercept ln R0 and slope minus k. And if you are rewriting this equation and you are plotting the graph log R0 there, you are keeping the log R0 by RT is equal to what you will get 2.303. Sorry, what we will get? I am taking Kt by 2.303. So, K by 2.303 into 
sorry t right not 1 by t k t into 2.303 so it will be k t by 2.303 plus 0 right so your value will be what it will be y equal to mx plus c where x is in the t t in the x axis log r0 by rt in the y axis you will be getting a y intercept zero value that means your graph is originating from zero so you will be getting a straight line like this with a slope k by 2.303 that is for the integrated rate equation of first order reaction and whenever you see this two graphs you should know that it is the integrated rate equation or graphical representation of first order reaction so see some examples is for first order reaction that is the hydrogenation of et into form ethane is an example of first order reaction and natural or artificial radioactive decay of unstable nuclei that is also of first order kinetics and decomposition of n2o5 and n2o are of first order kinetics okay now let's see the Half-life of a reaction. Half-life means the time taken to reduce the concentration of reactant to half of its initial value. The half-life of a reaction is the time in which the concentration of a reactant is reduced to one half of its initial value and T half is represented with letter T 1 by 2. Okay, this is what the half-life. And for the zero order reaction, what we got K is equal to R0 minus RT by T. When time T is T half, at that time, what will be your final concentration? It will be half of the initial value, right? So, T half is equal to what R0 minus half of the initial value R0 by 2, right? Whole divide by K. That you will get what 2 R0 by Sorry, 2 R0 minus R0 by 2K that is equal to R0 by 2K. That is what your T half for a zero order reaction. So, see, for a zero order reaction, the half life is directly proportional to the amount of reactant, initial concentration of the reactant. So, whenever as the as you increase this time with increase in the concentration, the T half value will be increasing. That means T half is directly proportional to the initial concentration of the reactant, right? And for the first order reaction, so this is the equation for the half life of a zero order reaction. And for the first order reaction, we know that K is equal to 2.303 by T log. R0 by RT. So, when T is T half, RT will be R0 by 2. So, what you will get? T half is equal to 2.303 by K into log R0 by R0 by 2. So, R0, R0 get cancelled and you will get log 2. So, by do, substituting the values, you will be getting 0 0.693 by K. That is the T half of the first order reaction. See here, the T half is not depending on initial concentration of reactant. So, keep in mind that for zero order reaction, the T half is directly proportional to the initial concentration of reactant. And for the first order reaction, T half is not at all depending on the concentration of the reactant. And for zero order reaction, the T half is equal to R0 by 2K. And for the first order reaction, T half is equal to 0 0.693 by weight constant K, right? So, that's about the integrated rate equation. Now, let's see the temperature dependence of the rate of reaction. As I told you, whenever we are increasing the temperature, with a, uh, for in every 10 degrees Celsius rise in the temperature, the rate constant is nearly getting doubled, okay? So, we know that whenever reactant molecules, see here hydrogen iodide and hydrogen and iodine molecules are combining. When these two molecules combining, they should form an activated, activated complex. See, these two are combining to form a, 
these two are combining to form an activated complex C here and the energy required for the formation of this activated complex is called activation energy. See here, the energy required to form the intermediate, that intermediate called activation complex or activated complex is known as the activation energy and once this reactant molecules attain the activation energy, then only it will be converting into the product okay and see that the energy of the reactant product is always lesser than that of the reactant molecules and whenever this reactant molecule attain the activation energy then only it will be converting into the product okay so when you are increasing the temperature see this is what actually the graph okay see when you increase the temperature you are increasing the temperature with the 10, de 10 degrees celsius see more number of molecules are getting the activation energy and there is an increase in the area. The area shows that the fraction of additional molecules is, is reacting. More number of molecules will be attaining the activation energy and more molecules will be converting into product. That is why whenever with an increase in the temperature, the reaction rate is also increasing. So, increase in the temperature of the substances it will increase the fraction of molecules which collide with energies greater than activation energy. So, with 10 degrees Celsius increases, we can see the fraction of molecules that form the activation complexes is increasing and the energy of activation initially it was up to here. Sorry, energy of activation was up to here. When you increase the temperature, the energy of activation get decreased. That is the effect of temperature on the rate of reaction. Now, let us see the effect of catalyst. We know that the catalyst will speed up the reaction. How? The catalyst will also reduce the activation energy so that more number of molecules can attain the activating complexes and can convert into product. A catalyst is a substance which will increase the rate of subreaction without itself being undergoing any permanent change. Whenever the reaction is speed up, the catalyst is not undergoing any change. Okay. So, catalyst will speed up the reaction without itself undergoing any permanent chemical change. And the catalyst will provide a pathway by reducing the activation energy. It will reduce the activation energy so that more number of molecules can attain the activation energy and more reactant will be converting into product that means it will lower or reduce the potential energy barrier that is how the catalyst is acting so now let's see the what are the important characteristics of catalyst so we know that only for a for a large reaction we require only a very small amount of catalyst a small amount of catalyst can catalyze a large number of reactances and the very important thing is a catalyst do not alter the delta G or gives energy value of a reaction. Okay. Catalyst will not alter the delta G value and it will catalyze the spontaneous reactions. Spontaneous reactions means the reaction which will start by its own without any external requirements or external and Fully. The catalyst does not change the equilibrium constant of a reaction and we know that the catalyst will catalyze both forward and backward reaction. That is why the catalyst presence of catalyst will not affect its equilibrium constant for a reversible reactions. Okay. These are the characteristics of a catalyst. Okay. Now last thing is the collision theory of chemical reaction okay so collision theory of chemical reaction according to this theory the reactant molecules we are considering it as spherical molecules okay so whenever this reacting molecules collide with each other the reaction is proceeding okay not all the collisions will lead to or will lead to a conversion of reactant to product only those collisions is with Efficient collisions are those collisions which can lead to product formation and it, the molecule should be in proper orientation itself. Okay. So, 
the reactant molecules are assumed to be hard spheres in collision theory and reaction occur when the reacting molecules collide with each other and if you take a mixture okay if you have a unit volume of the reaction mixture and in one second how many collisions are occurring that is what the collision frequency okay the number of collisions per second per unit volume of the reaction mixture is known as the collision frequency z okay and also we forget to mention one more thing in the effect of temperature sorry in the effect of temperature we forget to mention the arrhenius equation that is k is equal to a e raised to minus e a by r t okay and when you are provided with two rate constant log k2 by k1 is equal to ea by 2.303 into 1 by t1 minus 1 by t2 these two equations are very very important equation the effect of temperature on the rate of a reaction is expressed by the arrhenius equation and if you are provided with the two temperature and two rate constant this is the relationship i forgot to mention it in that slide okay now moving on to the collision theory okay so as we mentioned that the number of collisions per second per unit volume of the reaction mixture is known as the collision frequency set and the last one is i told you not all the collisions will convert the reactant into the product there should be it should be an effective collision then what do you mean by this effective collision the collisions in which the molecules collide with a sufficient kinetic energy the molecules should, the collision should be effective then the react when the reacting molecules are colliding at a sufficient kinetic energy and it should be in proper orientation so as to facilitate the breaking of bond between reactant molecules and formation of a new bond so the reacting molecules should be with a sufficient kinetic energy and should be in a proper orientation then only it will lead to the conversion of reactant to product then only we can say it is a effective collision okay these are all the main important portions is in the chemical kinetics chapter so you should know the in, uh, average rate instantaneous rate the what is the rate low the order of the reaction and uh, uh, the one more thing is that the unit of rate constant k we can express the unit of rate constant by mole raised to n minus 1 sorry mole raised to 1 minus n mole raised to 1 minus n liter raised to n minus 1 second inverse based on that you can find out the unit of the rate constant the unit of rate constant the first order reaction second zero order reaction it's integrated rate equations okay integrated rate equations and the, the integrated rate equations and the half life the half life was zero order reaction first order reactions and then the effect of the temperature on the rate of reaction the graphical representation for integrated rate equation the temperature effect for that the arrhenius equation the effect of catalyst and finally the collision theory okay these are the main parts we have to cover in the chemical kinetics chapter so i hope this revision classes is very helpful for you so prepare well for your exam and wishing you all the very best. Thank you.